بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, All praises for Allah سبحانه وتعالى alone and I send salutations upon this Prophet and Messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and upon his family and upon all of those who follow him in goodness It is known that Allah سبحانه وتعالى has sent down the Quran as guidance for mankind and he sent down the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or he sent the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a mercy for mankind. And the medium in which or through which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala chose to convey the message of Islam is the Arabic language. Hence Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions this in many places in the Quran. From them Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala he says, وَإِنَّهُ لَتَنْزِيلُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ نزل به الروح الأمين على قلبك لتكون من المنذرين بلسان عربي مبين. Allah سبحانه وتعالى he says that indeed the Quran is a revelation from the Lord of from the Lord of all worlds. وإنه تنزل به عليه نزل به الروح الأمين. It was brought down by Jibril عليه السلام على قلبك لتكون من المنذرين upon your heart, O Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, so that you may be from those who, who want, you may be from the warners. بِلِسَانٍ عَرَبِيٍ مُبِينٍ Through a clear Arabic language. And this is uh, chapter 26, ayah 192 to 195. So the language of the Quran is the Arabic language. The language of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Arabic language. The language of the companions radiallahu anhum ajma'een is the Arabic language. And there are some narrations that even say that the language of the people of paradise is also the Arabic language. However, many of the muhaddithun such as Ibn al-Jawzi and al-Zahabi and al-Albani have considered this narration to be uh, weak or fabricated. So there's no clear authentic hadith to say that the language of the people of paradise is uh, Arabic language. But ala kulli hal, the language of the Quran, the language of the Prophet wasallam, the language of the companions and the language of the Muslims is the Arabic language. Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said, Arabic is the symbol of Islam and its people. And language is from the greatest factors which differentiate between nations. From the greatest things or factors which differentiate between people and nations is the language and how they communicate with one another. And the symbol of Islam and its people is the Arabic language. In another ayah in the Quran, Surah Yusuf, ayah number two, uh, Surah Yusuf is chapter number 12. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Inna anzalnahu Quran arabiyya la'allakum ta'aqilun. That verily we have sent down an Arabic Quran so that you may understand. Now Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he comments on this ayah. And I want you guys to listen to what he mentions. Because what he mentions is actually very, very profound. 
and I'll repeat it as well, inshallah. He says in the tafsir of this ayah, and uh, for those that have tafsir and tafsir with Ibn Josie print, it's volume four, page 313. He says, the Arabic language is the most eloquent, clear, deep, and expressive of the meanings that might arise in one's mind. Therefore, and this is the part, this is the part when you, when you guys to focus on. He says, therefore, the most honorable book was revealed in the most honorable language to the most honorable prophet and messenger delivered by the most honorable angel in the most honorable land on earth and its revelation started during the most honorable month of the year, Ramadan. Therefore, the Quran is perfect in every respect. Subhanallah. What a profound statement a person ponders over that. I'll repeat it again for those who are writing. He says, the Arabic language is the most eloquent, clear, deep, and expressive of the meanings that might arise in one's mind. Therefore, the most honorable book was revealed in the most honorable language to the most honorable prophet and messenger delivered by the most honorable angel in the most honorable land on earth and its revelation started during the most honorable month of the year, Ramadan. Therefore, the Quran is perfect in every respect. And not only that, many non-Muslims, one cause of them accepting Islam is through appreciating the beauty of the Quran. And from the beauty of the Quran is the Arabic language. Because of this Quran's miraculous nature, and this miraculous nature, the medium in which it is shown is through the Arabic language. And this is why for this reason, you'll find many enemies of Islam or non-Muslims or or, or those who uh, follow uh, misguidance, they always attempt to drive or divert the Muslims away from their language. And I'm saying their language, the language of the Muslims, whether you're Arab or non-Arab, don't be shy of saying that my language is the Arabic language because you are a Muslim, so it is your language. So non-Muslims or and others, enemies of Islam, they try to always divert Muslims away from Arabic and then towards other languages to English or to Spanish or French or whatever the case may be. And they either do it by saying it's not important. While learning Arabic, you're not going to get a job. It's not important, whatever the case may be. Or by giving the impression it's too hard. It's too much. English, French doesn't have any of that. This was Sheikh Muqbil Ibn Hadi Al-Wadi'i Rahimahullah. He says in his book, Irshad Zawil Fitan. Irshad Zawil Fitan, page 65 to page 66. He says, uh, Sheikh Muqbil Ibn Hadi uh, Al Wadi Rahimahullah was a great scholar uh, of Ahl Sunnah from uh, Yemen and he passed away. Uh, he passed away recently. I can't remember the year. He passed away uh, recently. No. Uh, he says, around about 20 years ago, similar time to when Ibn Baz, Ibn Athameen, Albani, uh, when they uh, passed away. Rahimahullah. Um, so he says the science of the Arabic grammar is from the most important Islamic sciences, which is obligatory upon the Muslims to give it importance. This is because the enemies of Islam seek to divert the Muslims away from the language of their religion and busy them with that which is not from the obligations of their religion. Wallahu al-musta'an and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, is the helper. And just on this point as well, I do want to mention a point that Shaykh al-Usaymi hafizullah also mentioned. He says that a common mistake that people, um, a common mistake that people do is that they, uh, and he's speaking more to the Arabs, he's speaking more to his Arab students. Uh, and he says that they want to learn foreign languages 
and it applies to others as well. But they want they want to learn four languages: English, French, and so on, with the um, with the excuse or the reason of giving that to them and teaching them the religion. But he said, but Shaykh Rasimi, he says, he says, with this, a person can spread general guidance. As for specific guidance, then that can only be done through the Arabic language. General guidance meaning the general meaning, you know, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, not to shirk with him. Uh, you know, the general meaning is that every Muslim uh, knows. And the same can be said for the Quran. The general meaning of the Quran can be done uh, in, in, in another language because it is guidance for all of mankind. But the true meaning, the true understanding behind it can own that. So he's called it here specific guidance can only be attained through the Arabic language. And we're going to talk about this point um, shortly. So this is a small introduction to show you know, the importance of the Arabic language. So today's lecture, the way we're going to uh, split this lecture, inshallah, is we're going to split it into two parts. The first part is I'm going to discuss some of the benefits of learning the Arabic language. The benefits of studying the Arabic language, which also, if you understand all the benefits, it also shows its importance. So benefits slash importance can be you know, placed into, uh, in, into this part. And then the second half is going to be advices regarding, uh, regarding how to study the Arabic language. General advices regarding how to study the Arabic language. So the beginning, first we're going to talk about benefits and importance as well. So once a person understands the benefits and he understands the importance and he wants to learn the Arabic language, the question arises how, and that's what we're going to discuss regarding that um, in regards to the advices. And uh, it, we're going to split this, uh, or we're going to explain this with a number of points. And for each of them, I've mentioned 10 points. So I've mentioned, I'll mention 10 benefits, and then I'll mention 10 uh 10, 10 advices. Some of these points can, you know, you can make it into two points. You can make it into one. Uh, some you might you might think it's better to make it into two. No problem. I, I've some put together, even uh, even though I might think it's better to be two. But just so the number is more aesthetically pleasing and it's ten and ten, so you know it's, it's a bit easier like that. But and and this is the shirt and this is the you know the same proof that your person can use for taqsim of tawheed uh, from the proofs. How to split tawheed? Some of them might do three three. Some do two. Depends on how you look at it and how you want to explain it and what you want to uh, focus on. So we're going to start with the benefits. We're going to start with uh, the benefits of studying the Arabic language. Point number one is that it aids you in understanding the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran. It helps you understand the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, i.e. the uh, Quran. And we... We've touched upon this uh, in, in, in the intro, but again, I want to enforce the point that to have a true understanding of the Arabic language, uh, a true understanding of the Quran, and not to get confused with you know people that might be giving misinterpretations, mistranslations, and all of this, you have to learn the Arabic language. And that's why it was sent in the Arabic language. What's the ayah that we mentioned previously? Surah Yusuf, ayah number two. Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan Arabiyan that we have sent down the Arabic Quran. Why? So that you may understand, you may comprehend it. We have not, you won't be able to comprehend it in the same way in other languages. Other languages cannot do justice to the Quran. To translate the Quran into another language is impossible because the Arabic language contains so many meanings you can't convey in another language. And that's why. Um, the consensus of the scholars is that a translation of the Quran is not actually a translation, it's actually an explanation of the Quran. Because the full meaning of the Quran, the full meaning with the miraculous nature and, or, uh, and the challenge that is given to mankind and everything to do with it, that cannot be translated into another language. And this is mentioned uh, by, from the Fatawa of al Lajna Daima, volume 4, uh, page 164. And I've also heard some ulama, I heard the Lajna Daima, but I couldn't find a reference for it. But I have heard that one of them, uh, I heard from uh, somebody, I can't remember who it was, it was a few years ago. Uh, but they did mention that to translate, a con there's, they mentioned a number of conditions of translating the Quran. And one condition they said is that you can't call it a word for word translation. Because there's no way you, you are able to translate it word for word with its complete uh, meaning. Um, now, this point that I mentioned similar to the previous point, but slightly uh, different. So it is very important. And not only 
in terms of not uh, the other languages not being able to truly express and convey all the meanings of the Quran. But when you are relying upon other people's translations, you are in fact relying upon other people's understanding of the Quran. And especially if that person turns out to be somebody who is from people of misguidance, they're going to translate the Quran according to their desires and their beliefs. And that's not what the Quran is saying. And we're going to give them, uh, we're going to give a uh, definite, uh, an example or story regarding that uh, shortly. So a person just remains a foreigner or a tourist until he knows the Arabic language, because you just follow this person, go here, go there, doesn't, doesn't really know what's going on. But when he knows the Arabic language, he can understand the uh, Quran a lot better. And when a person does understand the Quran by learning the Arabic language, your love for the Quran, the Quran just increases. And you appreciate much more the beauty and the eloquence of the uh, Quran. And you understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it a challenge for mankind. Because no other language and why it was done in the Arabic language? Because no other language can uh, give justice uh, to it. So this is point number one. It aids you in understanding the Quran. Point number two. It aids you in understanding the speech of the Prophet It aids you in understanding... Sorry? Uh, you know the first point you mentioned, yeah. how it makes you understand the Quran. SubhanAllah, I remember the statement. Um, I don't remember which book I read it in. But it kind of said if they would see, the said if they would see the Quran as a rasail from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like messages from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, if you, if you, if you, you know, reword that or if you pose the question, imagine somebody has sent you a letter, your mother, for example. Let's say a person, you know, his mother grew up in another country or he never saw his mother for one reason or another. And his mother sent him a letter. But it's in another language. No doubt, he, the first thing he'd run to is get it translated. What does it mean? Um, what do you think about your heart? The other one who creates, created you, kind of tried to sustain no. you. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, no. it's quite a good question to think about. It. No, exactly. Yeah. Like yeah, no, without a doubt, whether it's your mother, whether it's a king, whether anybody of status, you would, uh, you know, go and go out of your way to uh, make sure you understand it. Or if it was like a treasure, let's say, or treasure map or something, then. You'll definitely go so that you can attain that gold or whatever. But when you learn the Arabic language, you attain that which is much more, the treasure which is much more, which is understanding the speech of Allah, which the Prophet ﷺ said the difference between the speech of the Creator and the speech of the cre creation is like the difference between the Creator and the creation. Now. And even the second point you're going to touch on, Allah, how is you going to help you understand the speech of the Prophet? ﷺ. Imagine this one. Uh, Said, imagine it's you, the Prophet Sallallahu in a room, and a translator, mm. and the Prophet speaking, and this person translating. How are you going to feel? You're going to be burning inside, right? Subhanallah, you can't directly speak to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi There's this middleman. How would you feel? You'd have this burning desire for the Arabic language. And sometimes I think about that. Imagine the Prophet was alive today, but you can't speak to him, and he can't speak to you. There has to be some translating. Yeah, that's Sometimes, sometimes, like giving you know uh, examples helps you understand something. Yeah, no, the ulama always give examples, but obviously examples, uh, as the ulama say, especially in aqidah, it's just to make the understanding easy, and uh, not necessarily to give exact paint the exact picture that is exactly like this, but especially when it comes to the Quran and Allah. Allah subhanahu wa taala has the greatest example. No. Um, so the second point is that it, it aids you in, under, in the understanding of the speech of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is a similar point to the previous point, uh, so I'm not going to talk about it too much, but I do want to mention a uh, point which uh, Al-Asma'i, -As Rahimahullah, uh, mentioned, who I believe passed away, I think, 210 or 206, um, so yeah, from, from, from the early ulama. He mentions a point which, subhanAllah, if you think over it, is quite... It's, it's, it's quite fearful. He says, Aksha, he says, I fear that the one who makes a mistake in the a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he will fall under the other hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever lies about me intentionally, then let him take his seat in the hellfire. Whoever lies about me intentionally, let him take his seat in the hellfire. He continues to say, this is because a person will say that the Prophet 
said such and such, but the Prophet ﷺ didn't say that. If somebody will say, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالَ بِالنِّيَاتِ The Prophet ﷺ didn't say that. He said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ So the person, is, is, he said, he didn't say, he, you definitely fall under hadith, but he said he fears that a person may fall under this, um, this, uh, this hadith, subhanAllah. Now, and this is um, mentioned in Seer A'lam al Nubala, volume 10, page 178. The third point. That's in Haraka. Huh? That's in Haraka. That's in Haraka. Imagine a Mabaluka Biloba. Yeah. Imagine a whole yeah. other language. Yeah. Where you have to. Yeah. 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 Imagine saying one Haraka wrong, which doesn't really affect the meaning too much. So imagine if it does affect the meaning. And you're conveying that to the people. Oh, sorry. Um, the third, the third, point number three, is that it shields a person from being ignorant of the religion. It shields a person from being ignorant of the religion. And in brackets, you can also add that it allows a person to defend the religion also. It allows a person to also defend the religion, which we're going to talk about shortly. This point is actually a result of the previous two points. So a person is proficient in the Arabic language then that means, and that would necessitate, you know, uh, with all the other sciences as well, that he understands the Quran. And if he understands the Quran, and then he also understands the Sunnah, if he understands the Quran and the Sunnah, then that means he understands the, the religion, because the religion is based upon the Quran and upon the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I have left for you two things. If you cling on to you, you will never go astray. Kitab Allah wa Sunnati, the book of Allah and my Sunnah. So the source, the main two sources of the religion and foundation of the religion, is a book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if a person doesn't really know uh, the Arabic language, he's not able to fully understand the Quran, he's not able to fully understand a hadith, and if he can't fully understand the Quran and fully understand the hadith, then how can he fully understand the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that's why numerous scholars have also talked about the importance of learning the Arabic language, while some ulama have either even considered it to be an obligation. I'm going to mention some of these uh, statements. And I'll, I'll try to mention it in chronological order, starting from the Salaf and moving down. So we start with a statement of Umar, radiyallahu an. Umar, he says, learn the Arabic language because it is from your religion. Learn the Arabic language because it is from your uh, religion. It's mentioned by uh, Ibn Abi Shayba in his Masannaf, volume 6, uh, 118. Now, Meaning, the same way learning about the prayer and how to perform umrah and how to, you know, pray the subjanat prayer. Just like um, that is part of the religion, learning the Arabic language part of the religion. Umar ibn Khattab is saying. No, he's saying that. It's part of your religion. And like I mentioned, some ulama have commanded people to learn. And some of you have mentioned that it's an obligation. One could maybe understand from this statement of Umar that it's an obligation. But we're going to mention a few others which are a lot more clearly the ulama saying that it's an obligation. Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he says, it is obligatory, clearly, it is obligatory upon every Muslim to learn the Arabic language, what allows him to make effort in fulfilling his obligations. What allows him to make effort in fulfilling his obligations is mentioned in Irshad al-Fuhul, page 421. And Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he also said in a uh, different place, the people have not become ignorant nor disunited except due to them leaving off the Arabic language. The people have not become ignorant nor disunited except due to them leaving off the Arabic uh, language. It's mentioned in Seer A'lam al-Nubala by Imam al-Zahabi, volume 10, page, 70, uh, page 74. And there's one more statement I mentioned of Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. He says, for the Arabic language itself is from the religion. So similar, you, know, you can tell that he's taken it from uh, statements of Salaf, from the Umar radiallahu He said, Ibn Taymiyyah says, from the Arabic language itself, oh, sorry, for, for the Arabic language itself is from the religion. Having knowledge of it is an obligation because understanding the book and the Sunnah, and the Quran and Sunnah, is an obligation. And the religion cannot be understood except by understanding the Arabic language. And that 
without which an obligation cannot be fulfilled, it itself is obligatory. It itself is uh, obligatory. Then from it is Sorry, is that the example of the, the scholars give, like the salah is obligatory? I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Anything which helps. I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Yeah. Like uh, he carries on to say, then from it is that which is obligatory upon every individual, and from it is that which is a collective obligation. He says uh, at the end, then from it is that which is obligatory upon every individual, and from it is that which is a collective obligation. So this statement of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah is basically what we were talking about previously. That wh why does he consider it obligatory? Because you can't understand the Quran and Sunnah properly without it. And if you can't understand the Quran and Sunnah properly without it, then you can't understand your uh, religion. So the only way you can understand your religion properly is through the Arabic language. Then he uses this principle, which is a famous uh, principle in Surah Al-Fiqh. Uh, and Surah Al-Fiqh is a science in which uh, you learn all these uh, principles and how to extract rulings uh, and uh, rulings from the ayat and hadith. It's not as simple as bringing an ayah, there's a way of extracting the ruling from there. So that's the science that looks into all of that. And from in that science is a principle which is مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ وَاجِبُ مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ uh, وَاجِبُ that, that, And that's what he says. He uses the exact same wording. He says, uh, and that which without an obligation cannot be fulfilled, it itself is, uh, is an obligation. So we'll give an example. Uh, many people give an example of wudu, even though one could argue that wudu has its own separate ayah as a delil. But just for understanding, uh, I'll use this uh, example, which is that you can't pray salah except with, uh, with wudu, right? So what's the ruling of doing wudu? If you can't pray salah without doing wudu, then it's obligatory upon you to do wudu. Because you can't, the, the same principle, ma la yitimul wajibu illa bihi fa huwa wajib. That which cannot, uh, that which uh, without uh, an obligation cannot be fulfilled, in uh, in of itself, that is also uh, obligatory. There's another principle, I'm going to mention this as a fa'idah, uh, which is similar wording. I don't know if you heard it, uh, Luqman. Ma la yitimul wujubu illa bihi fa huwa, what's the ending? You heard this one? Ma la yitimul wujubu. Ma la, so first one was Ma al wajib illa bihi fa huwa wajib. The second one, Ma la al wujub illa bihi fa huwa ghayr wajib. Fa huwa ghayr wajib. Uh, and that is uh, referring to, to, to those rules which you are. Uh, sorry? You mentioned it two days ago. Oh, he's doing quite fiqhiyat woman, right? Yeah. yeah so, um, like for example, bringing the, the, for zahar to be obligatory upon you. The son has to reach the zenith, right? What's the ruling on you bringing the son up? Obviously, it's not obligatory. You can't do that. So, in that that which, sorry, same same with zakah, same with zakah, reaching the nisab, reaching the threshold, that's not obligatory upon you. It's not obligatory upon you to earn that much money so that you have to pay zakah. لا. But if you do reach that threshold, then you have to give zakah. That's an extra point for you know for, for the students of knowledge who might understand. So, so, so basically. Uh, what you said is understanding the Quran and Sunnah, no doubt, is something obligatory because it's my religion, the Quran and Sunnah. And anything which helps me understand it is also not obligatory. No. Any, any, the ways to understand the, the paths to get to the Quran and Sunnah, any paths to get there, then also I have to. Also, it's obligatory, which is the Arabic language. F from the so ways, it is, is the Arabic language now. And this is according to the. the the statements that we have mentioned previously. And I didn't mention the reference. The reference of Ibn Taymiyyah's statement is Iqtida, uh, Iqtida Salat al page 295, page 295. So as you can see, these uh, aqwal, these statements that we have mentioned, they're not from any Tom Dick and Ari. They're from uh, prominent Islamic uh, figures, imams of the religion. And they are showing how important the Arabic language is. And this is why Imam Shatabi, he Imam Shatabi, he has a famous, uh, he has a very profound statement as well, where he talks about, and, and he mentions that a person should not even speak about the religion until they know the Arabic language. If you don't know the Arabic language, 
but no one will speak about the religion. And he mentions this in al Tisam, volume 2, page 309. So all of these points to show the importance of learning the Arabic language for a person to have a proper understanding of the religion. This is point number three. Point number four is it shields a person from making major mistakes. It shields a person from making major mistakes. So the third point was understanding the religion, but not only understanding the religion, but also it prevents a person from making mistakes. And this is one of the reasons why it is said, I don't know if I mentioned a few opinions, but one of the opinions uh, of why Arabic grammar was even written in the first place. Because obviously the Prophet and the Sahaba عنهم, and the Arabs before them, they spoke uh, fluent, eloquent um, Arabic and they didn't need to study it, right? So why, when, and who was the first person to write a book explaining the rulings of Arabic grammar so that people don't make mistakes? And they say that this actually happened by the command of Ali radiallahu anh. Ali, he commanded a tabi'i, Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali, from, from, from the great uh, tabi'in and he authored he, he commanded him to author a book in the Arabic uh, in Arabic grammar and why was this why was this there's a few different stories uh, there's, there's another story which I'm not going to mention but I've mentioned it in a different video uh, on mine I think it's titled Arabic grammar or something like that uh, you can check uh, that out but the story I'm going to mention here is that there was a person who came and he recited the ayah in surah to uh, at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Anna Allah bari'un min al-mushrikina wa rasooluh which means Allah and his messenger are free from the polytheists they are free from the, the mushrikun Anna Allah bari'un min al-mushrikina wa rasooluh this person came and he recited Anna Allah bari'un min al-mushrikina wa rasoolih not wa rasooluh wa rasoolih and that changes the meaning from Allah and his messenger are free from the mushrikun to, it changes it to, Allah is free from the mushrikun and the Prophet You can see how it changes the meaning completely and the meaning becomes a meaning of kufr. Uh, and this happened, why? Because the person was ignorant of the, um, he, he was ignorant of the, the Arabic language. So changing one haraka, one vowel, Rasuluh, Rasuli. Look how it changes, changes the whole uh, meaning. And this is mentioned in Sirah al volume 4, page 83. So that's point number four. Point number five is similar. Number four was it shields a person from making major mistakes. Number four, uh, sorry, number five, sorry, number four was it shields a person from making major mistakes. Number five is it shields a person from falling into innovations. It shields a person from falling into innovations. It's not just mistakes, like not just general mistakes that he made, but we learn that the Arabic language, knowing it properly, it prevents you from falling into innovations. And that also shows us that one of the main reasons people fell into innovations was due to their ignorance of the Arabic language. And it's something that you'll find in Ahl Bidah, especially now, they try to come and use all these Arabic uh, rulings and, and so on. But you'll find amongst the Salaf, and if you read the stories of the Salaf, the imams of the Salaf were not only imams of uh, the Quran and Hadith and Aqeedah, but were imams in Lugha as well, in language. And you'll find that they used to, uh, the Ahl Bid'ah weren't able to, you know, uh, prove their Bid'ah. And one of the ways uh, the imams of the Salaf would refute them was through the Arabic language. And I'll give you an example uh, of this right now. So there was a person, uh, so Al-Asma'i, rahimahullah, he narrates that there was a person called Amr ibn Ubaid al-Mu'tazili. Amr ibn Ubaid al-Mu'tazili who was from the head of the Mu'tazila at the time, the Mu'tazila being a, uh, a deviant sect. So Amr ibn Ubaid al-Mu'tazili, he came to a person called Abu Amr al- uh, He came to Abu Amr al-Basri. Abu Amr al-Basri, who is, you know, in front of Imams of Ahl al-Sunnah uh, and Imams of language, and also from the Imams of the Qiraat. He has got, uh, you know, like a right to Susi and Abu Amr. That's him, that's him. Um, so, Amr ibn Ubaid al-Mu'tazili, he came to him and he said, Oh Abba Amr, you know, he's come really happy because he, th he thinks he's found an ayah which proves his, uh, his innovation. And just before I mention it, this issue that they were talking about is the issue of the ruling of a person who, uh, who commits major sins. So 
ومعتزلة بليف سونيك ميتس ميجر سين ذا سيك هيز كافر اند هيز بين المنزلتين اند هيز ان ذا هيل فاير هيز ان ذا هيل فاير دي بليف ذات بيرسونال كول ميجر سين هيز ان ذا هيل فاير اهل السنه والجماعه بليف ذات هيز نوت ان ذا هيل فاير رادر هيز اندر ذا ويل اوف الله سبحانه وتعالى اف الله ونس تو فورجيف هيم الله كان فورجيف هيم اند اف الله ونس تو بانيش هيم ذن ذات از فروم هيز جاستس الله سيز ان الله لا يغفر ان يشرك به الله does not forgive anyone who commits shirk with him. ويغفر ما دون ذلك لمن يشاء. But Allah forgives uh, anything other than shirk or less than shirk لمن يشاء for whoever He wills. So Allah can forgive. So, uh, but أهل uh, البدع don't look at all of the verses. They look at certain verses only, and they say that no, person, anyone commits major sins, uh, he's in the hellfire. And and that's the difference with أهل السنة أهل البدع. أهل أهل البدع ينظرون جزئيا ويحكمون كليا. They look at certain uh, narrations and ayat and they give a general ruling. Ahl al-Sunnah, they look at all of the ayat, all the hadith, combine them, and then they give the, the ruling. So anyways, he came to him very happy, saying, I found an ayah which proves my mother. And he mentioned the ayah and he said, um, uh, and he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he never goes against his, uh, his, his wa'ad. Now, wa'ad means promise, but what he meant what he intended was wa'id, which is punishment. So he mentioned the ayah, وَلَنْ يُخْلِفَ اللَّهُ وَعْدَهُ Allah will never hinder, never go away from his, uh, from his promise. But he thinks it means punishment. Allah will never go away from his punishment. So a person who has made your sins, he's going to be punished. He's in the hellfire. So what Abu Amr uh, al-Basri, what did he say? He said, مِنَ الْعُجْمَةِ أُتِيت You have come from being an Arab, meaning you've made a mistake because you don't know the Arabic language. And he said the Arabs differentiate between wa'id, a promise, and a wa'id, which is a punishment. They consider hindering from a promise dishonorable. And while it's hindering from punishment, uh, something praiseworthy. You know, if you're going to punish someone, you let them off, that's praiseworthy. But if you make a promise and you don't fulfill that promise, that's dispraiseworthy. And then after that, he mentioned a number of lines of poetry, tobacco of his statement. And this is mentioned by Tafsir ibn Kathir, volume 5, page 385. And... So, so what was the reason of the innovation taking place or have, uh, him having this ideology was him not knowing the Arabic language. And this is why, uh, and this is what Hassan al-Basri, he said, whilst he, whilst he was describing uh, innovators, whilst he was describing innovators, he said, verily al-Ujma, i.e. being an Arab, verily al-Ujma has caused them to be destroyed. Verily al-Ujma, being an Arab, has caused them to be Destroyed. Uh, we move on, and that's mentioned in Khalq Afa'al al Ibad by Imam al Bukhari 106. Point number six, then the next point regarding the benefits is it is a key for a student of knowledge to understand the other Islamic sciences. It is a key for a student of knowledge to understand the other Islamic. Uh, sciences. So not only will a person be able to understand Quran and Sunnah, but also all of the other sciences of Islam, a person is able to understand them if he understands the Arabic language. And, and that's what Imam al rahimahullah he says, it is not enough for a person to be qualified to teach that he possesses a lot of knowledge regarding that science. Rather, he, along with the knowledge, should have a general understanding of other Islamic sciences because they are all linked, and I'm focused on this part, because they are all they are all linked. So it shows that all of the different sciences are linked, and they overlap, and they intertwine, and they help one another. And I don't want to go into how they intertwine, you know, we can talk about that, that, that that's going to take a bit of time to explain it. One good place, if somebody doesn't want to read regarding it, there's a book called Qanun al-Ta'asis al-Aqadi, Qanun al-Ta'asis al-Aqadi, uh, in chapter number four, the author talks about it there. So the point being is that they are all uh, linked. And what about the Arabic language? Then this is also linked with all of the other languages, uh, with all of the other sciences. And like I said, I don't want to go into too much how they are all linked. But one example to show that the sciences are linked is the ulama have differentiated and split uh, Islamic sciences into two, ulum al-Alah and ulum al ghayah the objective sciences, you got your tafsir, you got hadith, the main sciences, if you want to call it that, and instrumental ulum al-ala sciences, those sciences which are considered instruments to help you understand the objectives. So you have, for fiqh, you have usul al-fiqh. For hadith, you have mustalah al-hadith. And from ulum al-ala is the Arabic language. 
And it's like a key which allows you to understand uh, all of the other sciences. And this is what Imam Siyuti, he says in some lines of poetry. Uh, he says, uh, He says, Arabic language and vocabulary is a right upon the student of knowledge and take directly from the teachers and not from the books. The point in the first half, Arabic grammar and vocabulary is a right upon the students of, of knowledge. And also, if I many ulama, especially in the ending of the books of Usul al-Fiqh, they mention for a person to be a mujtahid and be able to derive ruling himself uh, from the Quran and Sunnah, he has to fulfill a number of conditions. And one of those conditions is Arabic language. And uh, one good place if somebody wants to read some of these conditions, Al-Alam uh, Al-Mu'allimi, uh, he has a good statement. So read his statement. And the first point that he mentions is Arabic language. Uh, anybody who understands Arabic can read his uh, statement. And this is because, again, many issues are built upon Arabic language. I'll give a simple example. How much of the head to wipe over is obligatory in wudu? Without a doubt, the sunnah is the whole head. But what's obligatory? Some have said a quarter, some have said a third, some have said the whole head. Why? Because of one letter. Allah says, uh, and wipe with your, over your heads or with your heads. That with or over is with what word? With what letter? It's ba. Right, what does ba mean in the Arabic language? Does it mean a quarter? Does it mean a third? Does it mean a part? Does it mean the whole head? So because of that, the ulama differ. Look, it has a direct fiqh uh, effect. Uh, now, so this is point number six that it allows you to understand other uh, Islamic sciences. Point number seven is that it increases a person in intellect. This is a bit of a long one. And uh, the reason it's long is because I've taken it from the speech of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, uh, where he mentions this in Iqtida uh, Surat al-Mustaqim, volume 1, page 527. He mentions that it increases, so the benefit of Arabic language is that it increases a person in intellect, morals, and religion. So it increases him in his religion. Uh, it increases a person in intellect, morals, and religion in a strong and clear way. It also affects the resemblance to this nation's early companions and followers and their resemblance, resemblance to them increases the mind, religion, and character. This is a bit of a long statement, but he mentioned a number of benefits. He says Arabic language increases a person's intellect, uh, in his morals, the way he conducts himself, in his religion, his iman, his religion, that uh, also increases. It allows him to follow the sunnah better, follow the companions better, and it increases him in his mind, his religion, and character. And subhanAllah, a person just ponders over this point. Uh, it shows the importance and the benefit of learning the Arabic language. And that it builds a person, not in just one area, but in a holistic manner, in so many different areas. And this, subhanAllah, you can, I can attest to that my understanding of the religion and so many other things changed after learning the Arabic language. And you can probably see this with other people as well, that compare the people that know the Arabic language to people that don't know the Arabic language. And you can see this difference between the two and the way they conduct themselves and the way they understand issues. It's a difference between them. Generally, not all the time. My English, generally. My, my, my English language improved. Your English language improves as well. Yeah, I, I, I learn a lot of words, especially in Arabic grammar. I learn a lot of English grammar words, which I never have a clue what they meant. Yeah. <laughs> especially, obviously, one reason because you're, one reason being because you're constantly looking for the... the, 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 the the dictionary, especially in the early stages of English. Yeah. 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 Number two, uh, Balagha. You know, eloquence and just, it's, it's difficult to, to explain how, but I definitely my English improved. No, no, of, of course, of course, no, of course, but without that, without that, no. Okay, uh, I'm going to go through my bit quicker now because I'm uh, conscious of time. Uh, point number eight is that it allows a person to communicate with other Muslims. It allows a person to communicate with other Muslims. Now, this is general. Muslims, any uh, Muslims that I, I, like I uh, have met people and know people who live in other countries that don't speak English, don't speak uh, Urdu, uh, and other languages that I know. But the way I communicate them is Arabic. The way I and I'm not even talking about Arabs. Not forget Arabs. Not even non-Arabs, because other students' knowledge have learned, so I communicate them in uh, with them in Arabic. So this is general, and more specifically, you can communicate with the ulama. And you can read the books of the ulama in the Arabic 
language and you can do it directly without a translator without any of all of that hassle that we talked about previously point number nine is that it is a means of gaining reward and i'm not gonna i've got I had a few points but i'm not gonna go into it uh, and the reason you can gain reward is because it is considered seeking knowledge it's a type of seeking knowledge so all the effort you put in learning the arabic language you are gaining reward and it's one of the best actions that person can do because you are learning uh, you are seeking knowledge about islam and point number 10 is that it helps a person memorize and understand what they are reciting. So when you are, uh, so when you are in salah, one way to increase the khushur is that you now you know the Arabic language, you know what you're saying. When the Quran is being recited and the Imams are reciting in tarawih, you understand and you can concentrate. You're not daydreaming for an hour because you don't know what you're saying. When du'as are being made or you want to make du'as, you understand what they mean. When you want to memorize the Quran yourself, it's easier because you understand the meaning. If it's a story like Surah Yusuf or something like that, you can also follow along, like chronologically follow along, you understand what's uh, going on uh, and so on. So these are 10. No. Can you imagine? No, 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 finish at this point. This, Danny, uh, good question to pose. Pose a lot of questions today, I want to add. It's the difference between a person praying Tawaj for an hour and you, you know, when the ayah of Jahannam made me talked about, he's with it. When the uh, verses pertaining to paradise, he's with it. The verses pertaining to the prophets and messengers, he's with it. It's a world of a difference to a person who was just enjoying the voice of the Imam. The Imam, without oh, that. Ahmed, was nice, that one, that was nice. Did you hear the way he read, you know, the, the no. support? And... No. It's quite... Yeah, subhanAllah. I mean, that's one of the miraculous nature of the Quran is that even if a person doesn't understand, it still doesn't have an effect on it. But obviously, if you do understand, then that's going to have even more of an effect and your khushu and your salah and uh, quality is just going to increase and like you mentioned when uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure everybody listening knows that one Arab uncle that's, that weeps in Ramadan just cry because you hear him crying and yeah. it's always Arab it's always yeah yeah, 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 yeah Arabs because they understand yeah I understand I, I person should be jealous wallahi a person should be jealous when you see another person crying in salah in Tawami he should be jealous mm. for many reasons the first one he's understanding the, the verses and number two, his heart is soft, inshallah. Inshallah. Is and, and you notice that these people who are crying are not necessarily ulama or even students of knowledge. They can be a general yeah. person. Yeah, I am. I am. But I, I do want to point at the same time, though, just because a person is Arab doesn't mean they understand the whole Quran. There are many things in there that they don't understand uh, as well, especially nowadays. Uh, but obviously, some ayat, you know, like, it's hudan lil muttaqin or hudan lil nas. It's guidance for all of mankind. So, general guidance can be attained and general understanding can be. Um, I think no. So these were ten points showing the some or ten benefits of learning the Arabic language, which also show the importance of it. That allows you to understand the Quran, the Sunnah, the religion, keeps you from mistakes, bid'ah, and so on. And if a person understands these points, you'll understand why the Salaf award really strict the Arabic language, and they were disciplining their children when it came to the Arabic language. Uh, Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he said, the Salaf would discipline their children if they made mistakes in the Arabic language. Thus, we are commanded, either an obligational or a recommended command, meaning either wajib or mustahab, okay? Recommended or obligatory. To preserve the Arabic principles and to rectify the tongues that have gone astray, meaning if somebody makes a mistake, you correct them. Hence, they may preserve for us the correct understanding of the Quran and Sunnah, and that we may follow the Arabs in their speech if the people were left with their mistakes then this would be something which is looked down upon and a deficiency he mentions this in Majmu al-Fatawa volume 32 page 252 252 so with this we come to the conclusion of the first part of uh, this lecture which is regarding the benefits uh, of the Arabic language and now we're going to move on to the second part which is advices regarding how to study. And these advices are general advices. They are general um, advices. And more specific advices, you know, we could say the best thing is that if you have a teacher, you ask them. So specifically for your situation and so on, that you go to your, uh, you go to your teacher. So in regards to the yeah. advice, now. Do you think we should uh, cut this live and then start another one? You want to start another live? That's fine. That's fine. I feel like people see the one hour for two minutes might be a bit daunting. That's fine. That's fine.
Okay, so I'm saying to you, I don't know, I think it does just, just go on to YouTube and we don't use that. So this is khas for you guys. Um, uh, this is khas for you guys. If I'm looking this way, and if you don't know, that's because the original idea was an Instagram Live. Um, but I decided to have a second recording that's backup, just in case the quality of that, or it doesn't save, or something like that. Uh, that's why. You know, so if I'm looking this way, that's because that's the also that's how it was advertised and so on. نعم شكرا. السلام عليكم. السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. نعم. أحسن الله تفضل. نعم طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So in regards to advices, we finished the benefits and clarifying the importance of the Arabic language. And now we are going to move on to the advices in or general advices regarding learning the Arabic language. And like I mentioned, these are general. A specific advice would be go to your teacher. So for your specific situation, you go to your teacher, but we are going to mention general um, advices, inshallah. The first point is a really big point, but I've summarized it in a few words, which is take all of the spiritual means. Take all of the spiritual means. And this includes many things. It includes being sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you are not learning the Arabic language uh, to, you know, debate with people. No, are you doing it for in ma'a? In ma'a is a, a term which basically means, you know, you follow the people. That, it's like a trend now. Some people are doing it, so you do it as well. You don't do it so that you can uh, say that I know the Arabic language or you can show people. No, you do it sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You, from taking a spiritual means is that a person stays away from sins. And we know that uh, the famous story of Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, that he forgot some knowledge and he wasn't able to remember as much knowledge and memorize because of uh, because of sin that he fell into and we have the famous uh, lines of poetry um, I went to Waqi' that I complained to Waqi' his teacher uh, regarding how bad my memory has become uh, when you change it from Arabic to English. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll um, get it to you on the end of the end. The, the lines of poetry is, it's not as, as nice as in English. This is just work in English. Yeah, poetry is very, very hard. Continue with translation of that. Yeah. Uh, so you say, I complain to Wakir regarding, how, uh, regarding my bad memory. So he guided me towards uh, leaving off sins. وقال إن العلم نور the value of this knowledge is a light ونور الله لا يؤتى لعاصي and the light of Allah is not given to a sinner and similarly سهل بن عبد الله وسهل بن عبد الله he says حرام على قلب أن يدخله النور وفيه شيء مما يكره الله عز وجل he says that it is impermissible for a heart to enter into it light Whilst within that heart there are things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, dislikes. And you'll find that this is how the ulama were. Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, rahimahullah, he sometimes would um, read for one ayah a hundred different tafasir, a hundred different, and he wouldn't understand. So then he would go to a far place, to a masjid. He would ask Allah to forgive him. He would istighfar about a thousand times. He would rub his face and himself into turab, into sand. And then he would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he would say, Ya Mu'allim Ibrahim, Alimni, or the teacher Ibrahim, teach me. Ya Mufahim Suleiman, Fahimni, or the one who made Suleiman understand, uh, allow me to understand. 
So you can see that they are taking all these spiritual uh, means by making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al Ali. He is all knowledgeable. And any knowledge that we have, then it is complete, pure guidance and a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not something that we deserve. So if somebody wants more knowledge, then uh, seek it from the all knowledgeable. Um, and, you know, this point can be talked about a lot. Uh, uh, Sheikh Al-Asimi talks about it in his Ta'azim al-Ilm, point number one and point number two, uh, and, and others as well. But I've just summarized it, uh, which is taking all of the spiritual means. So this is very, very important. That's why it's number one. Even though I'm not going to talk about it too much, uh, but it is from the most uh, important, if not the most. That's point number one. Yeah, yeah. I'm in New York. Uh, point number two, second advice is don't think that Arabic is hard. Don't think that the Arabic is hard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرُنَ الْقُرْآنَ لِلْذِكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ That verily we have made the Qur'an easy. So who, who's that's going to learn it and memorize it and so on? And if the Qur'an has been made easy, then obviously the ways to attain the knowledge of the Qur'an have been made easy. And from that is the Arabic uh, is the Arabic language. You know, many, many students perceive Arabic to be difficult. It's not difficult. It's easy, but it might take a while. And it... It requires a bit of hard, a bit of hard work from yourself, but in of itself, it's not hard. And like you said, examples are good. So just, just like uh, any person that would go to a university, for example, you are hearing words, scientific words, which are not even English. Uh, you've probably never heard of, but people are memorizing, understanding, uh, passing exams. So what about, you know, the, what about the Quran, which has been made easy? Um, anyway. The Quran which has been made easy. Um, anyway, so the Arabic language isn't isn't hard, but it does take a little bit of while, a little, a little while, and it does require effort, without a doubt. But it's not something hard in a sense that I can't do it. Look, a person can do it if he is sincere and he follows the advice which are going to be mentioned. And this is what Ibn Athimi, rahimahullah. No. And this is what Ibn Athimi, rahimahullah. He says. He says this in uh, his explanation of uh, La Jurumiya, phrase number five. He says, Arabic grammar in the beginning is difficult, but in the end it's easy. And it has been likened to a house made out of canes, but its door is made out of metal. Meaning, it might be hard to open the door in the beginning, but once you've opened it, then all the treasures inside are there for the, uh, are, are, are there for the uh, taking. And that's why Al-Kasai, who's from the ulama of Arabic language, he says some lines of poetry. Um, he says some lines of poetry and he says, أَيُّهَا الطَّالِبُ عِلْمَ النَّافِعَةِ أُطْلُبِ النَّحْوَ وَدَعْ عَنْكَ الطَّمَعْ إِنَّمَا النَّحْوُ قِيَاسًا يُتَّبَعْ وَبِهِ فِي كُلِّ عِلْمٍ يُتَّبَعْ He says, O student of beneficial knowledge, seek the Arabic language, I learn the Arabic language, and leave off being greedy. Verily, it is only an analogy which is followed, and with it, you can benefit in the other sciences. Meaning, it's only analogy, meaning it's only a few rules. Maybe getting your head around some of the rules it takes a bit of time, but then that's it. Once you've understood, understood the rule, it's just applying it, applying it, applying it, and that's it. It's uh, easy. And then he also mentions the point that we mentioned previously, and with it, you can benefit in all of the uh, other sciences. Um, Naam, you want to say something? Assalamu alaikum. Mm. Uh, maybe perhaps two things. The first one, uh, 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 touching on the point that uh, the Arabic language is not difficult. And the Arabic, perhaps the one way I would word it as that is the Arabic language in of itself is easy, but there are factors which make it make it difficult. For example, for example, remember, as Allah said, well, Allah has been made easy to remember. So, is that one who will remember? The Quran, memorizing the Quran is easy. But there are factors which will make it difficult. For example, not having a teacher. If you don't have a teacher, it will be difficult. If you have a teacher, obviously it will be easy. For example, another factor which may make it difficult, even though memorizing the Quran in itself is easy, a factor which make it, will make it difficult is memorizing from different masjids every day, different prints. That will make it difficult. Um, not having... There are factors. So sometimes something itself is easy, but there are factors which make it uh, make it uh, difficult if that makes sense. Yeah. And the second point, he was mentioning, subhanAllah, how Arabic grammar is, is difficult. In, in the same instance, 
how true is this? And I remember the first time hearing the Fort Mansour and Majroor, I remember exactly where I was sat, what room, perhaps even, I could say the month and around, what, it was towards the end of the month, I remember it was August. I was like, what is this? I knew I had a kitab and I had a qalam of Fort Mansour and Majroor. I said, I don't know what this is. I said, Abdul Salam, Abdul Salam, Abdul Salam, he was teaching me. Uh, excuse me. And now, and, uh, uh, and Grammy, it's just, it's just a rule. Tell them for it's going to be in the soul. Allah is in your own. It's just a bunch of rules, just like I said in the point. So anyone who's perhaps studying out the grammar now and thinking, oh, not that much, but first again, mm. just be patient and it will be easy. No. Like drinking water, subhanAllah. No. So, I mean, uh, even like uh, some of my students, when we were studying Medina Book One, the first chapter, first few chapters, they found it a bit hard, too many new words and so on. Once you got to chapter 10, chapter 10, I decided to give them an exam. And before the exam, I said to them, okay, I'll, let's revise it together. But revise it as a class, I'll go through it. And uh, if you've got questions, you can ask as well. <laughs> the first five, six chapters, we literally did it all in one lesson, revised it. I said, subhanAllah, this that maybe took a few weeks for us to finish. You've done it all in one lesson. So that's the same thing. They found it hard in the beginning, after it just... It became easy. And obviously, chapter 10 is not the end of the book. That's only halfway through the book. SubhanAllah. In regards to the first point that you mentioned, uh, I want to mention something similar uh, to that, which is that uh, I mentioned that it's not difficult and it may take a bit of time. A common question, which is asked, you know, how long will it take for me to be fluent or how long will it take for, for me to know the Arabic language and learn? And uh, the answer is that, uh, similar to what you said, it differs depending on different factors. So it depends on the intellect of the person. Obviously, some people are clever and some people are not as, uh, as, as, not as intelligent. So obviously, how much they, they're able to take in is different. Uh, also, the um, dedication and the amount of time that a person puts in. A person having one lesson a week is different to a person having two lessons a week. Or a person who has one lesson a week and he's revising constantly is different to a person who's not revising. So the dedication and the amount of time and the effort also plays a factor. Also, the goal that people want to get to. Uh, if you want to become like a scholar in the Arabic language, that obviously has a longer journey than somebody who just wants the bare minimum. And also your teacher as well. How good is the teacher? How proficient is he? How, even if he knows the language, is he good at teaching? And all of these. Uh, and also a student, how is he studying? Uh, what syllabus is he going through? Um, like you mentioned, if he's memorizing Quran, is he jumping from book to book and mushaf to mushaf. He's going from Pakistan one to the Saudi one, and, or is he just sticking to one? All of these do um, take a, uh, or, or play a factor in how long it takes for a, it takes a person to learn the Arabic language. But I do want to mention again, that it's not it's not difficult. In difficult in the sense that I can't do it. It's, it's too much. Like, it's, a, it's a journey. Right? It's, a, it's a sunnah journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a journey, subhanAllah. Um, it, it is a journey. So it's a journey that inshallah we can understand the sunnah at the end of. Those who understand, <laughs> understand. Um, and also, a person should also understand that, okay, argument's sake, a person finds it really difficult. And what, we, what did we mention before? That person, he's doing one of the greatest acts of worship that he can do, which is seeking knowledge. So all of that hard work that he's putting in, and all that time that he's putting in, he's getting rewarded for it. The sweat, blood, and tears, as they say, all of that is being rewarded. Him researching, translating every single word on one page, he's getting rewarded for, uh, for it. He's actually, subhanAllah, from the kindness of Allah, he's actually being rewarded more than the one who's finding it easier. Mm, Just ascent. as in the hadith, ascent. the one who, uh, that, that he stuttered in the Quran has double the reward. Of course, the, the, everyone has their own virtues, but the one who uh, finds it difficult, he has more reward. Uh, um, point number three, advice number three, and I would see this to be from the most important points which a, a, a student in Arabic language must have, which is consistency. Which is uh, consistency. And this is from the greatest uh, factors in the religion generally, and more precisely, or more specifically, the Arabic language. Uh, and you'll find many students who study for a few months and stop. And they might start again a few months and stop. And a new course starts, different teacher. And after five years, he's in the exact same place where he was five years ago. But then you got somebody else who just 
But it stays stick to one teacher, consistent, takes a bit by bit every week. And you'll find after two years, Khas, he's reading, or two, three years, he's reading Arabic books himself. He is uh, listening to ulama himself. He might be able to translate and so on. And it's mentioned by many of the salafs. So for example, the famous statement of Imam Zuhri. He, Imam Zuhri sees, uh, speaks to his student and he's advising his student, Yunus, and he says to him, Oh, Yunus, do not try to overcome knowledge for verily knowledge is like a vast valley which uh, of valleys. Whichever of them you take will stop uh, you before you uh, traverse it. Instead, and this is the part which I want you guys to focus on, instead take it over the days and nights. Now take it by day and night, slowly, slowly. Yeah, And do not take it all at once. For whoever tries to take it all at once will lose it all at once. Rather take it bit by bit over the days and nights. And this is mentioned by Ibn Abdul Barr in Jami' Bayan al Ilm wa Fadli, Volume 1, page 431, narration number 652. And Zuhri also has another state, another similar statement. Uh, I remember reading uh, Shaykh Qasim's introduction to his mutun, saying something along the lines of that we became, you know, we became ulama of hadith by learning one or two hadith a day. So it's not about learning so much in one go, but it's about learning a bit by staying consistent upon that. And this goes back to the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said, أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْقَلْ That the most beloved actions to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala are those which are consistent even if they are uh, little, even if they are uh, little. Narrated by Bukhari, hadith number 6465 and Muslim 783. And this point of consistency includes another point which is Adam al isti'jal, which is not being hasty. So a person shouldn't haste, jump from teacher to teacher, uh, uh, expect to understand this in like a week or two. No, he sticks to what he's doing, takes a little by little, and he remains consistent upon that. But you'll find some students just hasty. Adar starts here, he's gone there. Adar starts here, he's gone there. And he does, he's here. He jumps from teacher to teacher, book to book. And he wants, after two weeks, he's like, I'm not at a level, I can't understand uh, these books. It's, it's only been two weeks. And you'll find that he might become an alim of the first page of every single book, but after that, he doesn't really know anything because of his hastiness. So consistency is something very uh, important. No. Point number four is having a teacher and having a, uh, and have, having a colleague, having a teacher and having a colleague slash uh, classmate. Like I mentioned, you can make this into two points if you want. Uh, I mentioned the reason why I made it into one point uh, in the uh, beginning. But having a teacher is the most important one. Having a teacher is the most important one because the teacher, he is the one that's going to guide you. He's going to tell you, because he's gone, he's, this journey or this path that you are taking, he's completed it or he's ahead of you. So he knows the obstacles that have taken place. He knows the different ways. He knows the different exits and junctions and everything that's going to come. So he's going, and he knows your state. So he knows which type of car you have, petrol, diesel, or what is it? And he's going to advise you regarding that. And this goes back to the first point. Some ulama have said regarding the first point, uh, which is just taking the spiritual means, is that some students, they have arrogance. And from that arrogance is that that person, his sheikh is his aql, his own intellect. Meaning he thinks, oh yeah, yeah, I'll take, by himself, oh yeah, this book, I know this book, I'll listen to this sheikh. And he's just doing his, his own thing. And if a sheikh says something, he's like, no, sheikh, but you know, this, the, this person said this, and this, and he's just, he thinks he knows. And you'll find that that person rarely does it be, be, become a means of benefit for the uh, people. And that baraka is not there. And uh, it reminds me of a line of poetry as well, where uh, the poet, he says, Tarjun najata walam tasluk masalikaha that you hope for salvation, but you do not take its paths or its paths. In the valley, the ship does not run on land. Meaning, you want to attain this high knowledge and this high level. But then you're not taking the correct path. You're not listening to your teacher. Every time a teacher says, do this, you're like, no, but what about this and this? I, th I think this. 
Well, who are you to, to say you, you're on your first lesson, you're learning Haza Kitab and Haza Qalam, that's all you know. This is a pen, this is a book. But you're telling your teacher, I think this book is better, and I think this is la. Because um, so what you want salvation, you're not taking a crack fast. Verily, the ship does not run on land. It might look nice, you know, look how massive it is and everything, but it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to go anywhere. And the second part of this advice is having a colleague, having a classmate. And this is very important that a lot of people uh, actually look over. Having a colleague is something very important that you can sit down or a classmate that you can sit down, you can revise, you can test each other. You have one issue, you ask him, you, you, you ask your colleague, he's one issue, you answer him. Motivate, yeah, you motivate one another, come, let's let's revise. And you can speak to each other in a way which you can't speak to your teacher. You can speak, uh, maybe you can get a bit heated in a conversation, you know, between yourselves, as long as it doesn't, you know, reach anything haram and there's uh, animosity or anything like that, or anything haram is said. But obviously, you can't do that with your teacher. It's a lot more difficult to have like a, uh, you know, stay within the boundaries of correct adab. Uh, and etiquette with your teacher, uh, but it's different with a classmate. You, you can be a lot more open with a uh, classmate. And, uh, and oh, 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 just, 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 no? And you compete with each other. You know, yeah, have some healthy, healthy competition. Now. You can compete with one uh, another, and also you, you you can feel a lot more comfortable with your uh, colleagues uh, or classmates or making mistakes. You might, you know, in a class, you might feel shy to ask a teacher regarding a certain issue. But with a friend, it's a lot, you know, privately, it's a lot more easier, uh, for example. So there's a lot of benefits, and it's very important. That's why when I teach Arabic, and uh, mashallah, I know, I know you do the same as well, is uh, to have these revision sessions and revision groups. So it's very important for students to get together and revise together, and uh, and so on. No. So that's the point number four and advice number four. Advice number five is, I'm in New York. Advice number five is at the darwaj Atadaruj. And this is Atadaruj in Arabic means to uh, level up. It means to, it means to level up in stages. It means to level up in stages. I.e., you study books according to your level, and then you climb the ladder. Then you move on to the next, and you move on to the next, and you move on to the next. And a, a common mistake which I've seen a lot of students do, and then when they uh, I'll, I'll get to what they say later. But one of the first books that they study, they don't know any Arabic, not, not a word, maybe Alhamdulillah, Na'am, Islam, Alaikum, Alaikum, Islam, that's it. And the first book that they study is Al Ajrumiyah. Yeah? Al Ajrumiyah, Al Ajrumiyah, however you want to pronounce it. Which is a. Sorry? So Al Ajrumiyah is basically a grammar book. And the ulama, many of them, they advise that. This is the, one of the first grammar books a student should study and seek your knowledge. However, people don't understand sometimes. The ulama are speaking to Arabs. They're speaking to Arabs who already know the language. So now they are polishing up their Arabic uh, grammar rules. As for a person who doesn't know a word of Arabic, how are you going to go in? And the first thing, you're going to be all technical. This is marfu'u, <laughs> You know, it's, 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 they're not going to understand anything. And I, I know people, I know students who have come, they have studied Ajurumiya. And you ask them, they, I don't have a clue what I said. <laughs> Just wasted their time. Why? Well, because that Tadaruj is not there. That Tadaruj is not, uh, is not there. And Tadaruj is a well-established... Sorry? Perhaps this connects back to the... Maybe not, but maybe having a, a teacher. Uh, oh, yeah, not just a teacher, but one who knows how to teach. No. And this, uh, so I was going to say that at this point, it's been established in uh, in the Quran, in the Sunnah, and it's in Islamic uh, tradition. So in the Quran, the Quran itself was revealed over 23 years. Tadaruj. كَذَلِكَ لِنَثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ وَرَتَّلْنَهُ تَرْتِيلًا Now why was the Quran revealed in stages? كَذَلِكَ لِنَثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ So that, O oh Muhammad, we can, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we can uh, make your heart firm. And also another benefit I'm going to mention is that depending on the situation, an appropriate ayah can be brought down. And then in Islamic tradition, we have the mutun. We start off maybe in Aqidah, for example, with Usul al-Thalatha, Qad al And then we move on to Kitab al-Tuhid, Aqidah al Then we can move on to Hamawiyah al tadmuri in stages. Just like a person in the UK, for example, they would go to school, GCSEs, then A-levels, and then a BA degree, then an MA, 
and then a PhD. Nobody goes and sits in a PhD class straight away. And even if a person wants to teach, then you got to do a teaching degree. So this is uh, Tadaruj. And this does link back to how does a person know how to do a correct Tadaruj. You go, you go back to a teacher. And that teacher knows your state and he knows uh, your level that you are at. And, um, and he can best uh, advise you. He can best um, advise you. And I also found a one issue, which, which is quite astonishing. People don't realize a lot of students in UK and in the West, they study Arabic grammar and they study, they might even study the Medina books or Arabic or whatever it may be. But then they get to a level and I meet, I meet them and they've told me I've studied this, this and that. They got decent Arabic, okay? Me and my year, two years later, they're in the exact same place. And I've, I've, I've tried to see what, why have they not progressed? Why are they in the exact same place? Because it's been, they've learned for two years, they got to a decent level. That's been another two years and they're not able to read the books of ulama. They're not able to listen to Arabic lectures. They're still listening to English. And what happened, what I found is that some of them, they just stick to the same level. They finished one Arabic grammar book. They don't move on to the higher level. They just move to a different syllabus with, on the same level. I know uh, one student, he did them like some of the Medina book series, a series. Then he went to Jamit al Imam. And then he went, <laughs> some students, subhanAllah, once you get to that level, so if you finish the Medina book, the whole course, including the side books, not just the Medina book, but including the complementary books, which is part of the syllabus, which a lot of people uh, miss out. Then, khalas, and after that, move on to the, the next level. Don't move, don't carry on learning, uh, going through the books which are teaching you basic Arabic. Now, then move on now. Start reading the books of ulama. Force yourself to read the books of ulama. Read maybe shuruh of books that you've studied in English, usul of salasa, stuff like that. Move on to the next level. That's part of the daruj. So, subhanAllah, you might think that the daruj is some people are going too high and going to the big books for the small books. But so I've also found the opposite that there are some students that just stick to the level and just jump on the same level. And they don't really, they're just jumping around the same soft, they're not moving to the next soft, they're not going to soft all uh, lower. No. So uh, that, I mean, yeah. so that is regarding at the root. Point number six is something very important, which Sheikh Haytham Sarhan really drills. He drilled us in Medina. And uh, with my Arabic students, I always like to bring ulama. So obviously these are private for the Arabic students, but I like to bring the ulama down and they advise the students. Sheikh Haytham Sarhan has come and he drilled, same thing. And we, when we were in Medina, he did the same thing as well. And we'll get, I'll explain what he said. But point number six is live with the language by using all of your senses. Live with the language by using all of your senses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us. He's blessed mankind with different senses. Seeing, um, uh, speaking, feeling, all these different senses. Use them. Make everything around you Arabic. So you should only be reading Arabic. You should only be speaking Arabic. You should only be listening to Arabic. You should be writing in Arabic. If, even, if, even if it's an English lecture, at least the ahadith which are being quoted, write them at least in Arabic. Yeah, Use as much as you can. The Sheikh said even change the settings on your phone, change it to Arabic. In the beginning it's hard, but you'll get used to it. Make everything around you in Arabic. Uh, and subhanAllah, this actually happened in the uh, in Medina, I don't want to mention the brother's name, but the Sheikh was going around. And alhamdulillah, we had quite a few students of knowledge. So I told the Sheikh that in our group, we've got a few students of knowledge. She said, okay. So he started asking everyone, what are you learning? How much are you learning? And uh, most of the students who were learning Arabic, they said, we've got th three days a week. We're doing three days a week. And the Sheikh said, that's not enough. That's not enough. He, that's the Sheikh. But forget that point. It's the next point, which, only, which is quite, uh, it's quite funny. Then he moved on to another student. And uh, he asked him, and he said, uh, Sheikh, I do six days a week. I got six days a week of Arabic. And in my head, I was thinking, Mashallah, smash day. He's the Sheikh, what's the Sheikh going to say? Uh, and the Sheikh, he did say, he said, Mashallah. But then he had a follow-up question. He said, where, where do you implement what you learn? And he's like, uh, yeah, just in the lesson. Sheikh said, what's this? That just in obviously the brother brother's thing is very good. Like the chef trying to motivate him and bring him to a higher level, or he's already in, he's trying to nurture him. Uh, but the point the chef's making is that okay, you've got Arabic lesson. Only in that one hour that you're gonna speak Arabic, the rest 23 hours of every single day and the 24 hours of that day that you don't study, you're not gonna use Arabic at all, you're not gonna practice it, you're not gonna to speak to anyone. So this is something very, very important that a person should use all of his, he should use all of his senses. Uh, he should uh, listen, look, speak, uh, write all in 
uh, all in uh, all in Arabic. And Ibn Khaldun, rahimahullah, he has a, a statement uh, which is quite profound, and he says that listening strengthens a person's speech. He mentions this in his book Al-Muqaddimah. Um, Al-Muqaddimah Ibn Khaldun is known as. Listening strengthens speech, and write and uh, and reading, and reading strengthens writing. Uh, along the lines, he says something along the lines. So if you see a person who's speaking very good Arabic, know that he's listened a lot, and he's not just somebody who's just read. And if you see a person who's able to write very well, then know that he's read a lot, and you'll find that you find some people that are very good at writing. Those are studying UK and so on. They're good at writing. But then the Arabic, the speaking is not as good as the writing. Why? Because they're not listened, nor have they practiced as well. But they've read a lot, they've read a lot, and, and they, they've written. So subhanAllah, that is something very uh, profound. Point number seven, I've kind of uh, overlapped the two points. Uh, point number seven is practice a lot. Seven, number point number seven is practice a lot. I've kind of uh, overlapped the two. The sixth one was to use all, all the senses. So make sure you, you use all of the different avenues. Don't restrict it to just reading. Don't restrict it to just that. And point number seven uh, was meant to be, uh, okay, now that you're using all these avenues, keep practicing, keep practicing, keep implementing, keep implementing, and so on. It's a level higher in the explanation. I kind of mixed the two, but these are two separate points. Number six is live with the language by using all your senses. And number seven is practice a lot, practice a lot, apply, apply, implement, implement, and so on. And subhanAllah, you know, some students, they get to a level uh, or they study for a little while, and they've not got to the level that they want to get at. And you can see because they're not really practiced. It's just that one hour lesson that they're doing and then they leave it for the whole week. Okay. And they, they, maybe, they maybe think that oh, I have to sit down and one hour I'm just translating one page. Everyone goes through the same uh, journey. We went through, I remember days. I used to go to Masjid from Asr all the way to Maghrib. Sit there. I remember I took, I think it was the Qasr uh, This one, small book. Stories of the Prophets, yeah? And uh, it's got actually Lil Aqfal, which is meant to be for, for kids, basically. But I used to sit, and I used to come back to my room at night, and all I've, all I've understood is one or two pages. One of, the book's about yeah, two or three hundred pages. And I was translating every single word. Now when I read it, I read those books, and I, those words, and I'm like, okay, these words are uh, very easy. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, now. But everyone goes through it. Why? You have to persevere. You have to have that sabr. You have to keep practice, practicing, practicing. Sit down with that dictionary. Write down the words, and then uh, keep reading, keep revising, keep uh, implementing, and so on. And that's how you will gain and get to the next, uh, get to the next level. Um, I'm, I'm gonna speed you. I'm gonna speed you off now. Uh, we, we, I'll finish in the next five minutes, inshallah. Point, point number eight is do not be shy. Point number eight is do not be uh, shy. There's many aqwal regarding this. Uh, Mujahid, the student Ibn Abbas, he said, narrated by Bukhari. Uh, narrated by Bukhari. He said, the shy and the arrogant will not learn. Or he said that two people will not learn, the shy and the arrogant. And this is because an arrogant is quite straightforward. He thinks he knows, so he's not going to learn. And the shy person, because if he doesn't understand something, he's not going to ask, so he's not going to learn as well. And shyness is. Yeah, or he's shy to make mistakes, he's shy to practice. So he stays, he stays quiet and he can't speak, for example. Um, and shyness is pra praiseworthy. The asal is that shy shyness is praiseworthy. And there's many narrations regarding that. That the Prophet said, uh, al haya kulluhu khair. All of shyness is good. And um, all, all of shyness is good. That's narrated by Imam uh, Muslim, hadith number 37. But in certain scenarios, it becomes dispraiseworthy. And that's when that shyness prevents you from ibadah, prevents you from learning, and so on. And that's why Aisha radiallahu anha, she praised women because they, they did not let that shyness prevent them from learning about their religion. So Umar sallam radiallahu anha, she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and she had a question regarding the menstrual cycle and how to have a ghusl and so on. Now, obviously, coming to a man, the person and the day he's a man, it might be difficult and she might be shy. But what did she do? She came and she recited the ayah. Wallah, la haq. Allah is not shy from the truth. So she asked the question and the Prophet gave her the answer. And then Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, Ni'man nisa, nisa ansar. How great are the women of the Ansar? Lam yakun al haya an yamna'ahunna yatafaqahna fi din. That haya, shyness does not prevent them from learning about their religion. Shyness did not prevent them from learning about their 
uh, religion. And the previous two points, uh, I mentioned my Imam Bukhari in the, the chapter of, in the book of knowledge, in the chapter of uh, shyness in knowledge. And especially, especially with teachers and with colleagues, a person shouldn't be shy. A person shouldn't be shy. In fact, that is the place of making mistakes. If you don't make mistakes there, then you're going to make mistakes in, in other places. Like for example, me as a teacher now, if I make mistakes, especially basic mistakes, how bad does that look? I, I, I know I'm not on the level of a sheikh, I'm, not, I'm still a student myself, and I still study, and I still have uh, private lessons with my teachers learning the Arabic language, grammar, uh, vocab, and so on. I still have those uh, lessons. But now, because I do teach, if I was to make a mistake, how bad does that look? I would rather I make a mistake in front of my friends, even if they laugh, you know, friends laugh, it happens. Uh, and it stays between you, rather than me making a mistake in front of 100 other people, for example. Okay? So the shyness sh shouldn't prevent a person, a person should always uh, not, uh, should try to practice. When you go for Umrah, for example, use your Arabic. It doesn't matter if they speak Amiya, it's Lang. You speak your Fusha. You speak your, uh, you speak your formal Arabic and you practice and you practice. And don't worry if you make mistakes. If you make mistakes, your teacher will correct you. Your friends, your colleagues, they will uh, correct you. Now, point number nine, point number nine is having high aspirations. Having high aspirations. And a lot of students, they lose the motivation maybe later on in uh, seeking knowledge uh, generally and learning Arabic language specifically. And they always drop out or they just stop attending and so on. But a person should always do take those means that will allow them to rekindle that fire of uh, of uh, having high aspirations and having nuhma nuhma as Bakr Wazid mentioned, Sheikh Bakr Wazid mentioned in uh, uh, in uh, to Talib al Ilm that nuhma is like a burning desire, a burning desire to learn about the religion. And he mentioned a few statements of Imam Bukhari and others regarding that. And I mentioned three ways on how a person can remain steadfast and keep that motivation high when seeking uh, knowledge. There are more. Uh, I might actually end up mentioning four. One more just come to my head. Um, one is, the first is read the benefits. So if you're seeking knowledge, read the benefits of seeking knowledge and the virtues of seeking knowledge. Why has Allah mentioned these virtues? Why has the Prophet mentioned these virtues? To motivate you so that you can learn. And likewise, Arabic, the benefits that we mentioned in the first half of this lecture, read them so it can motivate you. Point number two is read the biographies of the Salaf. When you read the biographies of the Salaf, as Shaykh Qasim mentioned, it's like you enter a different world and you're living with the Salaf. And if you learn what they went through, then uh, that allows you and helps you uh, uh, in this journey. The third is making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Allah to keep you firm. Our Iman, how many times did the Prophet Sallam ask uh, for the most frequent duas of the Prophet Sallam was, Ya Muqallib al qulub Thabbit Qalbi Ala Deenik. O turner of hearts, make my heart firm. Keep me steadfast. Upon your religion. Another dua in the Quran, Rabbana la tuzikulubana ba'adayt hadaytana. Oh Allah, don't allow our hearts to be um, to be uh, misguided after you have uh, guided us. And many other points can be mentioned regarding this. And the fourth is take some of the advices that we've given before. Take a little bit, don't overburden yourself. Take it slowly. If you need to take a break, no problem. You need to take a break, take a you know week or two off, it happens. Even in the university, we have at the end of semester we have a break, we have a summer break. A person, you know, we're not angels. We need, uh, we need time to relax. We need time to enjoy ourselves, uh, so that you uh, don't get burnt out. And point number ten, and this is the last point which we're going to finish with, inshallah, which is just start with a with an exclamation mark. Just start. Allah, he, and this is something. There's a, there's a clip is because uh, I think two three years ago I had the Sheikh Hisham Sarhan. It's on my channel where he gave advice to seeking knowledge. And it's funny because he kept saying ibda, ibda, which means start. And I'm translating start, start. And he's saying ibda, ibda. And for a good few minutes, we're just saying ibda and start, ibda and start. But Allah is very true. That what the Sheikh said is very true because what is it? Students go around asking, what should I study here? What do you advise here? Is this a good book? Is this a good? Which one's better, this book or this book? And they're asking and they're asking and they never stop. <laughs> they never stop, they never get anywhere. If that person just listened to the first scholar that he listened to who said study this book that's it close his mouth went and he studied the khlas by the time the other person finished answering the question this person has maybe halfway through the journey that he uh, wanted to be on so this is from the ways of shaitan shaitan is making you think oh i'm asking about the best way and this is the best way to do 
but this is a deception of the shaitan and just stop. You find yourself a teacher, a trustworthy teacher uh, who uh, is knowledgeable and who is uh, trustworthy and upon the correct aqeedah and so on. Khalas, stop. Just stop. Just start with it. When I moved to Tibetan, the, things, the, question, the very questions you have, you will answer it yourself if you actually start. How do I memorize? Start and you'll find out. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, read it before at night time. You will find out that was your own question. Yeah. I mean, I give an example of myself memorizing Quran. I never sat down, uh, read a book on how to memorize. You just do it. You just you go into the class and you do it. And then in the beginning, it's a bit hard. Uh, everyone's got their own way of memorizing. Some people got a certain way, some people have a different way. But after a while, you work out what's best for you and that's it. You, you work out your own way. Yeah. You work out your own way. Yeah. So uh, with this, we come to the conclusion of the, the lecture. I'm going to quickly summarize all of the points. I'm going to quickly summarize all of the points. So in terms of the benefits, uh, number one, it aids you in uh, understanding the speech of Allah, the Quran. Number two, it aids you in understanding the speech of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number three, it shields a person from being ignorant in the, of the religion. Number four, it shields a person from making major mistakes. Number five, it shields a person from falling into innovations. Number six, it is a key for a student of knowledge to understand the other Islamic sciences. Number seven, and this is a long one by Shaykh Islam. It increases a person's intellect, morals, and religion in a strong and clear way. It also affects the resemblance to this nation's early companions and followers and their resemblance to increase the mind, religion, and character. Number eight, it allows a person to communicate with other Muslims. Number nine, it is a means of gaining rewards. Number 10, it helps one memorize and understand what they read and recite. Uh, the summary of the advices, number one, take all of the spiritual means. Number two, do not think that Arabic is hard. Number three, consistency. Number four, have a teacher and a colleague. Number five, at the darruj. Number six, live with the language by using all of uh, the senses. Number seven, practice a lot. Number eight, do not be shy. Number nine, ponder over its, its import. Uh, number nine, sorry, is have uh, high aspirations. Have high aspirations. And we mentioned um, different ways you can do that. And number 10 is just start. Number 10 is just start. So this is a, you know, a general lecture where we went through some of the uh, benefits, importance of Arabic language and some advices on how to uh, study it. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to follow these advices and to make this knowledge a proof for us on the day of judgment, um, not uh, against us. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد جزاكم الله خيرا خير الجزاء أبدعك وحسيتها صلى الله عليكم سوري I just want to say I just want to say my phone turns my phone turns off I'm on 5% battery so نعم أكمل بارك الله فيك والله جزاكم الله خير that was I'm sure those who are listening are going to with us saying anything as I am that was truly, truly, truly beneficial. Allah May Allah bless you well. Uh, each point, like it could be talked about. No, of course. Yeah, uh, thirty minutes in of itself, for example. Uh, so, Zakat uh, al-Khair. I'm sure we're all going to write our notes. Um, and uh, most importantly, ask Allah for to give us the action. Uh, Tax upon these, uh, these, this knowledge you have gathered for us. May Allah reward you well. And. Obviously, now we have the new classes starting after Ramadan, after Eid specifically, uh, inshallah ta'ala. And then maybe as you already have picked up, we don't, when our school does always there to intake in our new students, intake actually only, uh, when I announce it officially, but those of you who are listening now, intake is only twice a year. Intake is only going to be twice a year, so this is uh, the second to last of the year, or the last, or the last to next one might be January. Um, all I can say is, uh, thank you for the Zakhla Khairan. That was yeah. truly beneficial. Well, yeah. that's Zakhla Khairan. Thank you. 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 We're not millionaires yet, inshallah, and perhaps you never know. Uh, and if you can't repay them with something physical, then then say jazakallah khairan. And the Prophet in mm -hmm. says, whoever says jazakallah khairan, then he is Abil um, Ghafiq, then he's, and he's giving his jura, inshallah. So jazakallah khairan is there, may Allah reward you well. And give you a for those, you and your family. Um, Amen.
Uh, she, it's late. If you want to do a Q&A, do a Q&A. If you don't want to... No, it's late for you. It's late for you, actually. Uh, we'll, 1 a.m. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, class, class. Really, really. Inshallah. 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 What you can do is maybe do that thing on your story if you've got any questions and we can answer it later or something. Yeah, you can log in. Yeah, we will, we'll do something, Inshallah. Yeah. Uh, wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.